All right, continuing on in the next part. I hope this is the last part. Uh, we'll see if I can bang it all out. Exercise is going to decrease the amount of plaque that they likely had, especially their whole life before that four years. Multiple studies show that even just sitting more is associated with increased plaque from this one. Those bars represent stenosis. More sitting, more stenosis or blockage of the artery. And then this one out of Dallas says, quote, each hour of sedentary time was associated with a 14% increase in coronary artery cancer. First of all, I'm, I'm just going to completely grant that I would expect the same association, that people who are sedentary more often will have a higher level of plaque development. But this actually gets us back to healthy user bias, because what also are the habits of those people who would choose to be sedentary for that period of time? And in addition to that, we haven't determined total causal directionality because there also is a factor with plaque itself impacting whether you would choose to be sedentary. For example, somebody with heavy occlusion in the coronary arteries, especially if they're on the verge of developing a stable angina, they're not going to have a lot of energy levels. So they're going to be more likely to be sitting on the couch, for example. This is important because anytime studies are shown, and I think that they're very interesting, as always, epidemiology is very interesting for hypothesis generation, uh, they're not great at proving causality unless you get high up in the threshold of Bradford Hill, which we'll get into at another time. But, but a general association is not one in which I'm going to quickly jump to the conclusion is causal. And that's why I think it's always important to emphasize that aspect of it. Calcium, again, they didn't match for physical activity. Next we have BMI, which I think is especially damning when you consider this statistically significant BMI difference from like 22 and a half to 26, which again, averages overweight. You know, heavier people are likely to have been heavier for longer and you know, for all sorts of reason, have a larger atherosclerotic burden, again, before those 4.7 years, but also current. Okay, a couple points. One is that, yes, uh, Tom Cruise has a BMI of 26. Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think, has a BMI of 30. Joe Rogan, I think he's, what, 26 or 27, maybe higher. The point that I was making from before is BMI is generally, if you're looking at a population average, is generally pretty good at figuring out uh, proportionality towards a population that's over uh, overweight on the fat mass aspect with, like, say, typical Americans. But if you grab a cohort of people that have the kind of lipid levels that we're talking about, my expectation is that they're probably going to have a greater proportional amount of muscle mass compared to the average American. Now, to be fair, I think it's worth fact-checking myself on the association. So I'm going to connect with somebody like Adrian Sotomoda, go into NHANES data, and create those uh, means like you see in the Miami Heart column where looking at a BMI of, say, 25.8, uh, which, like I said, is you know just into the overweight category, but with those same means and say the uh, metabolic markers like lipids, uh, with the A1C, with the CRP, etc., and see if I'm right. I might be wrong. You know, it's it's worth testing that hypothesis, at least on the association. That brings me to this study, which was done on people approximately 60 years old, so quite comparable to that 55-year-old average in the LMHR study. Well, looking to this chart, we can see BMI and plaque burden is very well linked. And while it is dwarfed by people in the obesity areas, you know, we can see on this chart where each group would land. If we zoom in, it is the case that the people in the control group's BMI would have about twice the amount of plaque as the people at the BMI where the LMHRs are. With kindness, Mike, I, here's, what I'd like to, here's what I'd like to suggest. I'd like to suggest you show this clip to Avi Bitterman. He is a prominent vegan, uh, know him well. He's very familiar with uh, statistics, and he could explain what it is that I would likely have been critical of with what you're showing right now. But I'll just say that I'm fairly confident he can correct me if I'm wrong, that he would object to what it is you're doing, and he'll explain why. And I just, like I said, I just kind of want to, I want to be a gentleman here. I think you'll find that that's kind of important to understand, particularly if you're um, drawing conclusions on statistical significance in other places in this video. Are, are, are. 
Oh, so if you were to say adjust the LMHR plaque numbers to include BMI, all of a sudden we'd probably be looking at a completely different picture. And yes, well, increased BMI means just more. That's an important point I don't want to miss, that it would be a completely different picture if adjusting for BMI. So you're, so correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds as if what you're suggesting, Mike, is that the differential between the Miami Heart at 123 mean average and the lean mass hyperresponder uh, cohort at 272, the top 10% of the top 1%, that that difference in the 4.7 years of exposure, which comes to around 700 milligram years of LDL cholesterol, that that would be mitigated by this difference in BMI uh, from the 25.8 down to the 22.5. That's 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 an interesting assertion and, and certainly something for which I would I'd be very interested to know if then you would apply this to other studies and how well they themselves are tracking BMI and those associated associated changes with plaque burden or calories and things that could increase atherosclerosis that way of course means you're likely to have more visceral fat, which is directly inflammatory and then can increase heart disease risk. But now let's get into what I believe are the biggest flaws of all, and that comes from our whistleblower, let's just call him a whistleblower, Dr. Spencer Nadolsky, who claims to have had a major role in the original study design before things were changed up a bit. And why did they want him on there? You know, maybe it's because he has some renown as the medical director at Weight Watchers. He went to Twitter and tweeted like 20 things, but for the reason that he was kicked out, he said, quote, so my biggest gripe is that this is being used to promote that LDLC is not harmful. In fact, it was the reason I went to the IRB, essentially the Studies Ethical Review Board, to express my concerns and was kicked out of the study. But it's not just about what the data is being used to do. He said that there were actual problems with the study, first of all, that they kicked out people who had a coronary artery calcium score greater than zero. To quote, one of the biggest goofs in the beginning was excluding those with a history of atherosclerosis. We did this for safety purposes, of course, because it wouldn't be ethical to have those with cardiovascular disease to continue to have a 190 and higher LDL. Because of this, a handful of young subjects were excluded due to having positive CAC score. This is super whack because they obviously could have gotten clogged arteries on their keto diet, so they're finding the people that did get that and then just like excluding them from the study and being like, look, their plaque isn't higher. And to my knowledge, the exclusion criteria for the control group was not as stringent. Feel free to correct me. But then being younger reminds me of this 2022 case. Okay, to hold it for a second. I have to, there's, there's a lot I want to respond to there, but I need to clear the air with these three things. And I had them drafted and needed to get clearance on just this. Um, one, I can't comment on anything internal with the study as it is ongoing. It involves confidential information among multiple parties. And everyone attached to the study knows this. If I shared anything internal, even just to set the record straight, I would risk getting kicked out of the study myself. That said, I can generally share that I've seen I've been tagged into many assertions floating around. Some of them are accurate, some are inaccurate, and, and some are just demonstrably false. Two, that said, if one or more of our investigators had a material concern, they can file it with the IRB, known as the Institutional Review Board. It's literally the purpose of having an IRB-approved study to ensure oversight. And three, lastly, importantly, I've maintained an exhaustive timeline for formal purposes, such as IRB review, for example. So if at the completion of the study, we want to go into the complete story, I'd be up for it, provided all parties discussed give their consent, of course. If they, if they had the expectation of confidentiality going in, as often is the case, then we should, we should respect that. But let me just opt in myself right now. I think it could be very productive. I think we can actually, I mean, it'd be interesting to, to you know, discuss the whole story. And as always, I would want to try to uh, keep it as respectful as possible. But, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting story to tell. I'll just put it that way. Report of two cars. Hi, guys. This is me recording 
in the future because I was in the editing bay. I'm, you know, was completing part two and this long comment came in from Mike the Vegan that uh, I think did a fairly good job of summarizing a lot of what gets addressed in the video ahead. And I sort of thought, what the heck, I'll just go ahead and leave what I've already edited in place for part two and then get to this comment because I think it'll actually help move the conversation along a lot better. So I guess this is almost like a, you know, a, a, a part two and then a part 2.5. So let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Okay, Mike starts out, says, uh, I appreciate that you're going to do uh, more parts, but I'm afraid most people will just leave it here and miss the roughly 20 study argument I presented after the video cut. I've already lost in their mind, and the video didn't even leave the starting box. Well, first and foremost, I, I don't think that there's there's a there's not a, a person versus person thing. I mean, I realize that we're kind of debating and challenging each other to some extent, but... Uh, not not to sound pious at all, the the winner is truth. Like this is a truth seeking exercise. That's actually what I really love about science. And if you've followed my personal story at all, you'll you'll know I'm definitely not in this for personal gain, especially given the the um, the career trajectory I had before jumping into this. I genuinely want to get the answer to these two questions. And so I feel from a truth seeking exercise, having these debates can be helpful. Not always. Sometimes they they veer off, and you know we'll kind of see how this one goes. But uh, I, I I'm very much in favor of this process and the process bringing us to an understanding of what's really happening. I want to I want to both know about the mechanistic aspect with regard to the lipid energy model, and I want to know about the risk, of course. Although I think most of us are more interested in the risk to get answered as soon as possible. Uh, I grade this out because you mentioned how some people were um, characterizing personal aspects of what your of your appearance and what you're saying, and which I don't really want to honor. If you know me, I I am not a big fan of personal attacks, uh, but at the same time, I don't try to police other people's behavior. But I will just sort of say, as a general for everybody listening, I do appreciate it when you can take the time to keep it within the bounds of reason and studies and so on and so forth. So if I can help, you know, provide some tone, um, that's, you know, something I love the most. He continues, uh, here's a weaker summation, study links under my video in the description above, which is great. Feel free to check them out. Number one, that sketchy comment about not matching exercise was because as the two studies I cited in the next study, next sentence mention, being sedentary is highly correlated with plaque with each hour of sedentary time equating to a plus 14% increase in plaque. A randomized trial would aim to match this because of how powerful it can be and keto people exercise more. And keto people exercise more. I'm not sure if you can just state that broadly. Uh, I don't think it is sketchy to look back at the data. If you see twice the level of activity in the keto group, then you know it is confounding variable that conventionally would be adjusted for. Again, I'm, I'm interested in anything, all data, period, that we could gather from uh, both cohorts. It's just the, the catch is that it all takes time. It takes money. It's, it's a matter of who you can pay to um, gather that data and also what the willingness of the participants are to use it. This is our first study go around. I would, depending on how much they would be willing to give up, I'd love to get as much as I could from any group. Now, that said, I do want to be sure that it's well understood that we're talking about associative data. So if you see an association, if a study comes forward and it says something like this, that there's a correlation between each hour of, of sedentary behavior and resulting uh, increase in plaque. Again, is it resulting, or is it that people who would choose to sit and play video games are also going to have additional habits that associate with um, other causal factors that can create the plaque burden? Maybe they eat more junk food and so forth, which is why the healthy user bias was of such interest for me for part one. So you're getting to exactly what I get very concerned about when looking at diet studies, because often what they try to do to control for this, as you're describing there, 
uh, is they use statistical instruments like statistical, uh, like sensitivity analyses, and they try to estimate how much each of these different other variables are themselves causal so that they can eliminate them. But those are all based on assumptions. We don't know for sure how much each thing is actually truly causal until we take greater effort with things like randomized control trials where we know that's the only variable of interest that we've really had modification for and has been well powered for. So all of this is to say, I'm not going to jump to any assumptions with regard to association based research. And I realize that that's very stock and standard for nutrition epidemiology, but I'm, I just, I really have a high standard when it comes to making claims of causality in general. And again, you can look at my prior social media, you'll find I'm very keen on not using the term causal very out, like literally do a search on causal in my uh, Twitter feed and uh, other social media. And you'll see just how much I talk about Bradford Hill and how much, um, I prefer using association and, you know, getting myself to use the term association as much as possible. Sorry to really linger on this, but it's extremely important because I feel like a lot of times people bring up studies as though, boom, it's as good as if you found the association, you found the cause. And I'm, I just do not share that level of confidence that I know a lot of other people in this space share. BMI difference regarding, regardless of the original intent of the study has a large bearing on plaque. As a study I cited showed, the BMI difference between groups roughly equated to two-fold difference in plaque. While I understand that you consider leanness a unique lean mass hyperspondent prerequisite here, it's, it's not a prerequisite. It's, it's, it's observational that we see greater leanness with that triad of the, of the three uh, markers. Uh, this is one of the most powerful factors that should have been matched since it could have. Actually, you'd, you'd be surprised. It's, it's very difficult to find this particular profile in the general population of this BMI and with these lipids and this, um, uh, this level of health. I was impressed at how much we were able to match, or I should say that the Lundquist statistician was able to match with regard to uh, the Miami Heart cohort. I, of course, wasn't expecting that the BMI would match closely. But I'll, I'll again emphasize what I said earlier in part two, which is that I think that if you look at the, the uh, high HDL, the low triglycerides, the A1C, the HSCRP, and you look at that in a group that has a comparable BMI, there are going to be a lot of people that look more like, say, Tom Cruise than somebody who you might normally think of when you think of somebody who's overweight. They're probably going to uh, high, have higher relative lean muscle mass, for example. Um, I, I kind of know this because there's a lot of people who share their lipid data with me that are outside of low carb. So I've gotten a bit used to this pattern recognition, but to be fair, it could also be biased on my part because I just tend to see the patterns of what people are going to bring forward to me in the first place. That's why I want to do the NHANES data, uh, reanalysis with somebody like Adrian Sotomoda, uh, who's great with these stats and would help to better elucidate that. Uh, then there were points made by Spencer Nadalski. Uh, so I'll just, I'll, I'll save you some time. I kind of said it a little bit earlier in those uh, three things that I kind of got clearance to be able to say. But once again, I cannot speak to things that are internal, that involve confidentiality across multiple parties. They have the expectation that those things will remain confidential and being that they're part of an IRB uh, approved study, that if it needs to be dealt with, it gets dealt with with the IRB. A again, the principal investigator is the god of a study and you want to be sure that you're always in sync with the principal investigator if you're on the outs with them because there's something untoward going on that's why you have an irb because then you can take that to the irb and that's a group of people who take the job very seriously that group of people will review the complaint that's being filed and you know if it if it's material they can stop a study they can shut down a study and do like i, I know many stories of irbs uh, just from being in the space for a while, where some things were going on that um, definitely required um, a shutting down of the, the study. So I bring this forward because I think a lot of people don't actually realize just how uh, controlled these things are and why it's so important for them to uh, be handled internally up until the point in which the study is over. 
And then again, as I also said in my statement, um, for everybody who would like to uh, opt in for uh, discussing what they might have otherwise had an expectation for confidentiality for, I myself would opt in like right away for you know the the whole postmortem discussion on the backstory because I think it'd be interesting and it might be productive. So, food for thought. On this topic, I also mentioned the case report of two carnivore dieters with high LDL age 28 and 32 with 90th and 97th percentile artery clogging who would have likely been excluded <laughs> skewing the data. Yeah, I'll just, I'll say for a lot of statements like this for which you're being very reliant on a source of information outside of Lundquist, let's just put a pin in it because we can revisit all of these claims such as these two would have been excluded from our study. Um, and we can look at it, you know, in light of the facts that are part of uh, what's been happening with the study and so forth. It's just, again, I can't really comment on it in the meantime. But with regard to this data being of special relevance to you, I would want to emphasize that this is a case series. So these are two cases. And as is the situation with all case studies, there's the risk of selection bias, even if it's unconscious. You might be a, a doctor who believes that a particular exposure has a particular harm, and you may have a patient pool that numbers in the tens or hundreds, and then you're spotting the pattern that you expected, but you don't actually know how much of that is by you know your own biases. Again, not even necessarily that it's conscious. This is why you do prospective studies. Case studies are retrospective. They're looking backwards and then determining. And don't get me wrong, case studies are very important. And, and I highly encourage people to make as many case studies around lean mass hyper responders as possible. We have one of our own. Ours from last year, we've done just one. And that one was on somebody who had an LDL in the 500s. And in the language of our case study, you can go read it right now. We're quite careful on our language emphasizing the limitation of it being a case study and that, of course, there's more data that's needed. And understandably, people might say, oh, you chose this one because it fit the expectation of what you uh, believe is typical of the population. And that, that would be a fair concern because for all we know, we'd be doing that unconsciously. But our case report doesn't negate these case reports or any other case reports. That's why we do prospective data. You determine the rules in advance, and then you execute against those rules to uh, find out what the outcome is in that population. My familial hypercholesterolemia argument citing a study in which people generally escape coronary artery disease for 25 to 32 years if they have more minor heterozygous FH, yet they still have a 13 times higher risk of coronary artery disease. Heterozygous FH has the same LDL 190 cutoff as lean mass hyperspondor study. This lower level of FH is generally associated with a three times risk of death despite the super high LDL. Okay. I'm just, I'm just going to quickly jump right to this. It's, it's super, super important that everybody watching this right now understands this key distinction between the granular and the macro. So it's true. It can take decades for somebody to develop symptomatic heart disease such that there doesn't need to be a scanner. You literally feel it. You either have a heart attack, you actually have an event, or you develop symptoms such as angina. Or there, there are many other ways, there are many other symptoms that can be suggested that you might have a heart attack that are symptomatic because there are because it's advanced plaque. You actually have, for example, an occlusion in your LAD that's so strong that it's really affecting the blood flow, it's really um, impacting your energy levels, et cetera. Okay, that's advanced heart disease, that's macro, that's large scale. Micro is what we're picking up with CT angiography. CT angiographies are state-of-the-art machines that can pick up plaques as small as one millimeter or smaller in some cases. They, they have enormous spatial resolution. That, that's microscopic. That is, that is extremely powerful. And that's why there's a level of confidence that you can expect with something like a one-year longitudinal study because of just how tightly they can get down there to see what's really happening. I mean, 
and I'm not even talking just plaque volume. There's now a level for which they can characterize the plaques themselves, whether it's, for example, a fatty streak or a thin fibrous cap. I, I highly recommend that everybody take the time to really learn more about CT angiography if they're interested in this research that we're doing. And to please stop confusing these two. It's advanced heart disease where no scanner is needed. Yes, takes a long time, but that's over a course of plaque building and building, building over years and years and years. You, you want, if you're especially feeling the urgency we are and trying to confirm or disconfirm the specific association of LDL with this outcome of plaque, particularly at LDL levels this high, you want high resolution. That's the whole point of doing CT angiography. So please bear that in mind when looking at any of these studies, uh, and particularly we're looking at uh, CCTA. You know, I, I may have it in a future, uh, I, I'm not sure if I can take the time now, but there's one of my favorite uh, papers is on children who have homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And I'm probably going to use it for my milligram years um, video, which points out that our cohort, the ones with 272, their average is above five out of the six children. And four out of those six children have advanced disease. They have multiple sites of atherosclerosis with less milligram years than our folks in the um, lean mass hyperspondor cohort. Again, this is auxiliary to the whole study that we're doing right now, and it's really just more for general interest. But it's really crucial that everybody understand the difference between these two metrics, advanced disease versus any plaque detection and whatever its level of progression is in a CT angiography. The lean mass hyperspondor and FH are not different enough since all LDL can oxidize. True. I spent several minutes showcasing studies on LDL oxidation risk of heme iron, of heme iron intake, heterocycle, okay, oxidize, uh, blood sugar spikes on too much protein, all of which would be more dangerous with higher LDL. Um, again, these are associational. Uh, I'll get to another comment once I finish this real quick. I then showcase a Framingham data showing that the lower triglycerides of lean mass hypersponders isn't enough to offer protection, again, associative. While I didn't include it in the video, the higher HDL lean mass hypersponders as presented as a bonus uh, of over 80 milligrams per deciliter is the exact cutoff associated in the 2022 study with twice the all-cause mortality and almost twice the cardiovascular. Yeah. So, listen, I'll... I'll absolutely concede all of these points in that if these associations are indeed causal, then they, sh they should show up in our population data. We should absolutely be seeing this uh, higher development of a uh, plaque. And here's the, here's the good news. We're not getting an ox LDL assay because I really don't care for the ox LDL assay. It's pass fail and it doesn't get granular, but I do like the oxidized phospholipid assay. And if I can get a little bit geeky for just a moment, what it is is it's picking up at a granular level the uh, per particle degree of oxidation as opposed to whether a particle is oxidized or not. The prior assay, the OxLDL, it tends to just associate directly with uh, LDL particle count. And there are other people who could tell you better than I can why that assay has that problem, including Sam Simekis. Um, but oxidized phospholipid is pretty strong. And I'm very interested in how it will associate with lean mass hyperspotters, which is why we're getting it. It's actually one of the assays I wanted to be sure that we had included in the study. It's not a major point of interest, but it's one that I'm very excited for us to finally be able to see because I speculate that on a per ApoB particle basis, they're going to have lower level of oxidized phospholipid given existing... Um, of surveillance, I guess you could say data, anecdotal data that's been reported to us in the groups. I don't want to get too lost in the weeds on that one, but if really interested in the oxidized LDL exposure hypothesis per se, then you might find this actually pretty interesting. Not enough is being done to let people know they're likely not lean mass hyperspondos, even if they think they are. 
Uh, the truth is, even if you believe this low quality of data compared to the Mendelian randomization studies, it probably doesn't apply to you, unfortunately. Believe this lower quality of data. Okay. Yeah, I mean, again, because we're literally capturing this relationship, this um, observing how much the LDL and the corresponding uh, correlation of plaque is, we'll have some understanding of it. One of the values in doing this at such a granular level is that we don't have to wait till people have full-blown um, advanced cardiovascular disease. This is, this is where having CT and geography really helps us out. So it's true. If Mendelian randomization studies, if all of the nutrition you know that, that links red meat and saturated fat and low fiber and so forth, all the cardiovascular disease, this is almost like a shotgun effect. All of these things are taking place at the same time in the same population because this population often is ticking all of the boxes for what might be considered a terrible diet uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint. So I, And yeah, if you throw in Mendelian randomization, if you, if you feel strongly about those as a metric of um of evidence then that then we would likely see this we'd likely see this uh causal relationship in this population i know i'm just some annoying vegan who you guys can't stand but i am also warning vegans about the risk of becoming lean mass hyperspondent on vegan keto so that it isn't some anti-meat bias uh actually uh, for what it's worth i'll i'll uh confirm what you're saying in that I have said the same thing to people who've considered doing plant-based but going keto. And up until really just recently, the presumption has always been so strong that it's uh, with saturated fat specifically, that it's basically impossible, that somebody couldn't be uh, animal product free and then exhibit the lean mass hyperspironal phenotype. But I can tell you directly that I've had a lot of anecdotal data that shows this. And Again, if following the logic all the way through, if higher LDL is independently causal for atherosclerosis, I will completely agree with the point that you're making, uh, which, for what it's worth, again, gets back to the very first paper we published on lean mass hyperresponders, where we show how people can typically reverse it if they're metabolically healthy and they may want to consider um, reintroduction of some amount of carbohydrates because that brings the, the LDL down substantially per the lipid energy model we're discussing. So th this is, again, another benefit of the research on the mechanistic side in that if we do ultimately uh, come to find that we're confirming the lipid hypothesis, then it's great. We're spring-loaded with a lot more information on what people can do about it, especially if they still want to keep to a lower-carb diet, but then it turns out that they can't be keto in this circumstance where they're especially lean and metabolically healthy. We'll see. Many people are convincing themselves that they are invincible or will become invincible when they lose that weight on keto, on their keto diet, and that's dangerous. I appreciate Sean's warning, but his video was maybe 80% celebration, 20% warning. I, listen, I, Mike, I do have to kind of bring to your attention that it's more helpful if you don't edit things in such a way that it looks like it's entirely celebration. If you want to get Sean's full context please at least try to keep it somewhat balanced in what the edit is that you have. Try to summarize it a little bit more. That's a bit more on the steel man position than the straw man position. I, I, can, I can tell you for me personally, and while I can't speak to the people who follow my work, I can tell you that um, I personally, I, I tend to think a source of information is strong when they seem like they take great care at conveying what the position of a certain person is. If, if they're saying something about a person, especially if they're showing a clip of that person, and then I go and chase down what the actual statement was, and it, the context is very different, then I, I have a more difficult time trusting that source. But, you know, it's never too late to change that. That I think it's a behavior worth changing. I myself would have preferred that you had a, a more um, accurate summation of where Sean was coming from. I didn't feel like it was uh, entirely celebratory. I felt like those comments that he was making and like right there in the middle were pretty strong comments and he emphasized the preliminary nature and that we need more data and so forth and he should be appreciated for that that's that's a very moderate position relative to a lot of uh the comments that you've seen and and have showcased i'm just just wanted to put that out there 
I think of the people who are seeing the results and even paying for the trial, seeing a lean mass hyperspotter in the mirror when their risk is through the roof, rejoicing in this good news about LDL. As someone with an M MPH, I don't want more people to get coronary artery disease from this. That is why poor Mi Mike, as Ken Berry put it, responded to this report. Thanks for reading for uh, people who got this far. Yeah, um, well, I'm reading it. I'm going to turn it into a video. So you can, you can trust that this is actually going to be going up on uh, my channel. And I, I appreciate you offering your additional thoughts. I appreciate this uh, dialogue. And, um, I, you know, I'm, I respect what degree you want to bring forward any concerns that you have, even if there's a lot that we don't yet know. But that's what we're doing now. We are actively gathering this data so that we can, better, we can get a better perspective of what's ahead. And for what it's worth, I think that you'll be very interested in the research we have planned. I can't speak to it too much yet until uh, we actually get the, the contracts in place and we also have to get IRB approval for those as well before we can actually announce them more broadly into their specifics. Uh, but I think you'll appreciate that they're, they're expanding further on these data. Again, assuming these data are worth expanding on, it could be that we come to February and the longitudinal data does showcase that there has been, you know, a substantial increase at a population level for plaque in our cohort. Don't know. We've only been able to see, of course, this match analysis, uh, which is separate from the original and primary endpoints that we have for non-calcified plaque volume uh, progression. Anyway, I hope this video didn't get insanely long. But I think this was kind of helpful for us to tag into my existing part two. And I, I hope this was helpful. Um, again, I appreciate the dialogue. I'll concede up front, though, as a, as a final thought. I don't really have a lot of time for making these. I'm not really a professional YouTuber, per se. And I don't want to do a ton of reaction videos. Uh, but that said, Mike, I, I did want to uh, take a little time to give a thoughtful response uh, to yours. And uh, so shout out to you and um, your following and your, you know, your fellow vegans and uh, to everybody else who's been able to participate in this discussion productively.